everyone. Welcome back from the poster session. If everyone could settle down, we'd like to get started with the paper session on pragmatics. And our first speaker will be Manuel Bon from Stanford and Leipzig. Thank you. Before I lose my voice, um, I want to do the most important, two most important things. So first of all, thank the organizers of the conference for this wonderful uh, conference. It's really my favorite conference. Uh, and the second thing I want to do is acknowledge my collaborators on this project. So this is uh, Michael Henry Tesla, Megan Merrick, and Michael Frank. Um, so the question that we're after here in this project is um, we want to look at what information sources children can use during language learning. And here we're focusing on a particular aspect of language learning, namely, namely referent identification in the moment. So language learning, of course, big topic, has many different facets, uh, different aspects to it. But here we're focusing on kind of referent identification in the moment. So if you think about this kind of a uh, little um, schematic example um, where you have a speaker here on the right side, maybe a parent and then a child on the left side, and then um, the speaker uses the word work um, and the child doesn't know um, what it refers to. So how can the child figure out um, what this word means? So first of all, um, how can the child figure out what the speaker is referring to, um, which would then allow, um, allow the child to kind of learn the, the label, I won't say mapping because Mike Tomasello is here, um, the label for this object. Okay, so there are different types of information that children can use. So an obvious source would be um, social cues. So in a sense, if the speaker is pointing to one of these objects and saying the word work, then this is pretty good evidence that, the, that work refers to this kind of reddish object here. Um, but kind of aside of these kind of directly observable cues, there are also more kind of psych psychological um, in information sources that children can use. So for example, um, they already established lexicon. So in a sense, if the child has already learned the word work, um, it's kind of easy for them to identify what the referent of this utterance is. Um, however, if they haven't, they need to kind of go on and further look further. Um, beyond that, another information source is, of course, common ground. So the idea here is that um, communication is situated in a specific context, and this context is to some extent person-specific, and kind of these previous interactions with a person give you some idea about what it's likely that they are, com that they are going to communicate or talk about. So here in this context, if the speaker previously told them um, that they really don't like cars, then in this context, if they later on somewhat excitedly use the word work to refer to an object in the context of a car, it's unlikely that it's the car which is the referent of the object. And another kind of source of information is um, kind of assumptions um, about how the speaker chooses their utterances. So in a sense, um, by reasoning uh, or by assuming that the speaker is trying to be informative or helpful, kind of this Greistian notion of cooperative communication also helps the child to figure out um, what they could potentially mean. So here in this context, um, the child may reason that, okay, they're using this word work, I don't know what it means, you also don't know what it means because it doesn't exist. Um, so uh, if they would have wanted to communicate about the car, um, and they probably know the word car and they're informative, they should have used the word car. Since they didn't, they probably mean the other one. Um, and so in that way, the child can identify um, the referent of this utterance. So this kind of paints a fairly complex picture in terms of um, different information sources are available to the child at a given time. And the question that we were asking here is how are these different information sources integrated with one another? Um, so most kind of um, studies looking at language learning so far kind of look at one of these aspects and find that children can use all these individual information sources in order to learn, to learn words or um, to learn language. And we were really inter uh, inter interested in the question of how they integrate these different inf information sources with one another. And kind of at the core of this, um, this addressing this question of how is a computational model that I will go into more uh, detail later. Um, but kind of for the sake of clarity, I will walk you through the empirical part first. Um, so what we did, um, we started out with um, kind of thinking about a, an experimental setup that allows us to manipulate these different information sources in kind of a common experimental framework. Um, and then we identified these different information sources um, and tried to implement them in different tasks. So here, um, in terms of cooperative reasoning, we, we looked at a mutual exclusivity inference. I know there are kind of different ways of conceptualizing mutual, mutual exclusivity aside from a pragmatic inference, but for the sake of, of this talk, I will kind of treat it as a, as a, um, as a pragmatic inference. So here in this context, it's basically the, the example that I described before. If you, um, if you see frog and frog uses the word work, you can reason that, okay, if frog would have wanted, communicate, wanted to, to ask, uh, tell you something about the car, they should have said car. Since they didn't, they probably mean the other thing. Um, and then kind of how can we now, um, and then kind of within this task, we also entered um, kind of prior lexical knowledge in the sense that we varied um, the different uh, the objects that were kind of located on this other table. So the assumption here is that the strength of your inference, how likely you are to make the inference that 
work refers to this novel object depends um, on your knowledge of the familiar object. So in a sense, if it's the car, which is a very familiar object, then you're all very likely to make this inference. However, a child might not, might not know what a pawn is, and in that context, the inference would be less likely. So in that sense here, we have an interplay between making this pragmatic inference, but also the child's lexical knowledge. Um, and so we, we identified different um, objects, or we kind of varied objects along a, a scale um, with which we thought that children might be familiar with certain words. And in order to do so, we used a, kind of this nice study by Cooperman et al., where they kind of had adults rate different objects um, on the kind of age of acquisition, where they think then, when they think they uh, children acquire certain words, which is totally off absolutely, but um, relatively um, it's, it gives you a pretty good impression, or it kind of matches um, empirical data. So we identified different objects, and, and then implemented um, this task on an iPad and tested children in the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose in California. Um, and here we, we looked at um, kind of just the mutual exclusivity inference depending on what kind of object um, is located on the, on the, other, ta uh, on the other table. And, um, and what we see here, so what I'm going to plot here is just uh, the mutual exclusivity effect by age continuously. And you're gonna see a different line for each of these different words. Um, and, they are, and, and the words here represent the object that is on the alternative table. And they are kind of color coded in the sense that the darker objects um, are the ones that are rated to be acquired earlier compared to the lighter objects. Um, and generally what we see is kind of um, that, so first of all, we see kind of a developmental increase in this um, ability to make this kind of inference, um, but we also see huge variation between the different items. So it really depends on what is the alternative item, um, um, whether or not children are making this inference. And this kind of uh, is roughly aligned with um, also what we hypothesized, what uh, the familiarity of children with these diff um, different items would be. Okay, so that's good, sorry. <coughs> So we found a task that um, allows us to kind of incorporate these two um, information sources um, and then to kind of look at the, uh, the other side, we, uh, um, we used a common ground task. So here for common ground, we used um, discourse novelty uh, um, as a manipulation. So imagine now you again meet frog um, and there's kind of one object present and now frog disappears um, and a novel, a second object appears and then frog reappears and asks for the work um, your inference might be that frog is um, communicating about the object that is kind of new in context because it's kind of more interesting to them. Um, yeah. Uh, and so this, when we look at this um, um, across, uh, across age again, so here I'm plotting the, the, pro uh, the proportion with which children choose the, the novel object in context, um, again by age, the same age range between two and five years of age. We see that children are across the board are willing to make this inference, but also that this kind of, the strength of the inference increases with time. Okay, so that's good. So we have kind of found these two individual, uh, kind of these three information sources that we can manipulate and we know that children kind of use all of them. So now we put them together. Um, so what we did here is we um, basically combined them in two ways. So one is a congruent way and one is an incongruent way. So you can imagine that kind of your mutual exclusivity inference and your common ground inference, both information sources should, could be aligned with one another, so kind of pointing to the same object. So here in that case, that would be a, if um, the object that is kind of new in context is also the object that is unfamiliar to you. So both information sources now point to this novel object as the referent. And again, in the incongruent condition, it's the other way around. So here now the familiar object that is going to appear um, on the second table is new in context, but it's familiar to you. And we were interested in how, how children will de deal with this tension and kind of integrate these information sources. So kind of in the, in the test setup, this is what happened to children. Um, um, so they, they saw these either um, kind of in a within subject design, they saw the congruent condition and incongruent con condition um, kind of uh, unfold in this way and then the test event was always the same where the, the speaker was asking for a novel object. Um, and so we had these kind of two different um, kind of qualitatively different conditions um, times the 12, I 12 items that we had. Okay, so again, this brings us back to the question of how information is integrated. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we used a kind of a, a computational model in order, to, in order to kind of address this question of how. Um, and in particular, we used the Rational Speech Act model. And these models are um, kind of characterized pragmatic inference as a social inference. And this is kind of evident in their recursive structure. So they, they assume that, or so they kind of, they structured in a way that they assume that, for example, um, a listener is reasoning about a speaker who is in turn reasoning about a listener. So making this pragmatic inference a social inference. And also built in into the structure is the assumption that speakers are communicating in an informative way. So they choose the best possible utterances given a referent and context. Um, so this kind of capturing the Gracian notion of cooperative um, communication. 
Um, I won't go much into detail about the model itself. Um, if you want to know more about it, then please come talk to me or MH um, later or um, go, um, go and look at our resources online. Um, but what this model allows us to do is now to kind of relate these different information sources that we have measured individually to one another using this model structure. And then it allows us to generate a priori model predictions about how, how these information sources should be integrated with one another. And I kind of want to stress the point here that, these, that we generated a priori model predictions, just to kind of counteract the criticism that, sometimes, that I sometimes hear that, well, if you have a model, you can always make it fit the data. So this is not what we did here. So we generated these predictions ahead of time um, and then kind of looked at um, how they compare to the data that we then actually collected for these combination um, of information sources. And also what this model allows us to do is generate quantitative predictions about how children should perform in these uh, different conditions um, and also developmentally sensitive uh, model predictions. So what did this, these model predictions actually look like? So for each of the items that we had, so the different objects on the alternative table and the two conditions, Sorry, um, we generate, generated a developmental trajectory of how children should integrate this, uh, how children should, um, like the, the, the kind of object that children should choose depending on their age and depending on the object and the condition. So here, um, so this is ordered by um, the, uh, the rate of acquisition, the, um, the rated age of acquisition, and here are our model predictions. So if, you, if we just look at these model predictions, so for example, what we can see is that um, the harder these um, these um, presumably harder these uh, uh, these words are getting to learn, um, the less likely children are to make the mutual exclusivity inference, which, which is plotted here on the y-axis. Um, in case, um, yeah, uh, and more and more likely to the model assumes that they're more likely to go with the kind of common ground information in this context. So, how do these model comparison uh, model predictions compare to the actual data? So here's the data for, for all of these conditions. Um, so what you're seeing here is on the one hand um, the data binned by year. Um, with 95% confidence intervals, but also um, a continuous kind of fitted curve because we collected data longitudinally, uh, sorry, uh, continuously across the whole age range. So how can we can now, now evaluate whether these are actually good model predictions or not? So first of all, we can look at them um, and see that um, usually kind of the green line and the red and the black line, they are kind of fairly close to one another. But to kind of to do, to do this in a more formal way, we can look at correlations between model predictions and the data. So for this purpose, we can um, kind of bin the model predictions by year and also bin the, mo uh, the, the data by year and just look at how well they are correlated. And here, um, if they're perfectly correlated, they should all fi fall on a, di diagonal, a diagonal line here. And what we see is actually there's a fairly strong correlation between the, the model predictions and the data across the, the different ages. Um, a little less so for the older kids, um, and the main reason for this is because our model makes very extreme predictions for the older, for oldest children. But uh, this re doesn't really tell us whether um, this is a, actually a good model compared to other models, or it doesn't tell us much about information integration. To get more at this question of um, how children are integrating information, we turn to a model comparison. So what we're doing here is now comparing different models that make different assumptions about how information is integrated and then compare the predictions from these models to the data and see which of these models best fits the data. So, so uh, kind of the one, one model that enters this, comp uh, this comparison is of course our pragmatic model, the one that I described to you, where kind of these two information sources are flexibly traded off with one another. And then we compared them to kind of lesion models. We, and these lesion models assume that one information source is basically neglected by children. Um, as soon as there are kind of conflicting information sources or multiple information sources, children start to neglect some information and just go with others. So in a, what we call a pragmatic global model for the lack of a better name, so, what, what's hap um, so in this model it's kind of structurally similar to a pragmatic model, but we, here we assume that children don't have um, individual world knowledge, uh, word knowledge, so that kind of the children's knowledge of the individual words um, is disregarded. So we just assume it kind of a gener um, general increase in lexical knowledge, but not um, individual, uh, but this is not specific to the individual um, items that we're using. Then in a prior only model, it's fairly straightforward in the sense that here we assume that as soon as there are two information sources, children disregard um, the mutual exclusivity inference and only focus on the prior information, so the common ground information. And then in the flat, what we call the flat prior model, here this is the other way around. So if, the, if there are multiple information sources, children only go with the mutual exclusivity inference um, and kind of disregard the common ground information. Um, and we can compare these models, sorry. Um, oop, no, you don't wanna see. <laughs> can I go back? Sorry. Um. Okay. Um, so we can compare these models um, 
via their um, log likelihoods. So how, how well, basically an indicator of how, how well they fit the data is these are large negative numbers. The less negative they are, the better the model is. And if we compare the models, we see that our pragmatic model has kind of the lowest uh, uh, kind of best fit to the data here, and even though these, these differences might um, seem um, small, they're actually huge if you do a, if you directly compare the models via base factors. So um, so if we uh, compare them these models directly directly using base factors here, we find kind of enormous evidence that the um, the, the pragmatic model fits the bet data better compared to the others. And here I'm I'm giving you log base factors, so you have to exponentiate these numbers, but they're just too large for the slides. Um, okay. So um, I'll skip a second study that is kind of structurally very similar, um, but which is already written up, so you can go look at it, um, and just kind of jump to the end. Um, uh, jump to the end. So what I hope, um, what I've convinced you of is that children kind of integra flexibly integrate these different information sources or different pragmatic information sources, and that a probabilistic model provides a kind of a theoretical framework to think about the process of how information is integrated. And also gives you, I didn't go much into detail about this, but also gives you a way to think about developmental change. So uh, the way that we thought about developmental change here in this uh, for, for this purpose was that we assumed that these individual inferences are what is, what is developing, but the integration process itself is constant over time. But this is, of course, an assumption that could be challenged in future modeling work, where you could look at whether or not you get a better model fit if you, for example, um, assume that the integration process itself is changing over time. And also kind of another future direction um, or interesting thing to do is because this is basically, we construe here a pragmatic inference as a kind of form of social uh, social cognitive inference would be interesting to kind of relate this developmental change that we observe here to kind of more standard measures of social cognition and see if we see um, kind of grounding it out in, in, in more standard measures of social cognition. And with this, I want to thank you and thank all the um, collaborators on this project. Okay, we have some time for questions. <coughs> Waiting to see if there's anyone in the back of the room who wants to ask a question. Okay, we'll start with Justin. Hey. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to talk about models a little bit. Yeah. Um, and the competitor models that you considered were also Bayesian. And um, in the original model that, that, you, that wins, um, the, the last step of the word learning activity is a judgment or a choice, a decision. And so for this model, it ends up being a weighted coin, a flip of a weighted coin, roughly, I assume, which, you know, to go to with, with the left object or to go with the right object. Um, and uh, go ahead. So what the, you're talking about what the outcome of the model predictions or the model prediction actually is or looks like? Yeah. Um, so it's a probability. Um, oh, so you just leave it. You don't flip the coin. But yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a probability. So we, we compare, um, uh, so for the model comparison, what we do is we compare the probability that we get for this, for a child of a particular age with a particular item for a particular condition, kind of take the, um, the prediction of the, what the, the model prediction, the proportion, and compare whether or not they chose it yes or no. And this is kind of how we get the, um, yeah. the, so the evaluation, how we evaluate the models. Okay. So... Um, this is a little bit, uh, my concern is similar to what Randy Gallistel brought up against the animal learning literature, which is that the animal learning literature says, look at how learning progresses gradually, you know, mm. over time, over trials. And Randy looks at the data and says, well, if you look at individuals, um, it's a step function for every one of them, but it looks continuous because you're collapsing across individual step functions. Yeah. Um, Something that would be more like a step function model for your case would be optimality theory. So um, if you took those as different constraints and had the highest ranked constraint win 100% um, to, to, to win the decision of where to go, um, that might be something more like the step functions that we see in individual animals. And so I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I, I wonder... Um 
you're right, in, in a sense, kind of the observation that uh, this could be kind of individual step functions that lead to this kind of a, um, a, a gradual increase. But we, I, I would say we don't know, um, because we ha we're dealing here not with a single information source. It might actually be that there's a, there's a more gra uh, gradual development. Um, but it would be interesting to see, but what we would need for this purpose would be individual level data, which we uh, um, kind of longitudinal data, uh, which we don't have, unfortunately, at this moment. Um, but definitely that would be kind of more telling in that respect, like how does the, the how do the individual trajectory, trajectories actually look like? Um, so yeah, um, um, something that I would love to do. Um, it's just a lot more work. Yeah. Okay, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> and our next talk will be from Claire Burgey from the University of Chicago. All right, uh, I'm Claire Burgey. Uh, I'm a grad student at the University of Chicago, and today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work I've been doing with Dan Yurofsky about how children can use presupposition to learn new words. So first I'll give you an example. Let's say you're taking care of a kid and you want them to take a bath. Um, one thing you could say is, do you want to take a bath? Uh, but this is pretty unlikely to be successful because the answer is likely going to be no. Uh, but there's some common parenting advice, uh, helpfully provided by Sue Carey yesterday, uh, that you ask a question more like this instead. Uh, do you want to take a bath before dinner or after dinner? And strangely enough, uh, children seem to respond with uh, after. Uh, and so it's a little bit puzzling on the face of it why this works, right? Because the one question includes the other. So why is it so easy for children to protest to taking a bath when you ask them, do you want to take a bath? Uh, and it's much harder for them to protest to taking a bath when you ask, do you want to take a bath before dinner or after dinner? But of course, we're all adults who speak language, so we know that the second question seems to assume that you want to take a bath, and it poses as the question when you want to do it. Um, and so I want to look at how kids might be able to make these inferences as well. Uh, so this kind of structure, the difference between uh, this assumed information and what's at issue is discourse structure. Um, and Let's say you have an utterance, you can break it down into three parts. So you have what's at issue, uh, what's presupposed, and uh, maybe some implicature. Uh, and I'm gonna take you through a little example here. So let's say you go up to someone and ask them, hey, is that a new shirt? Uh, what's at issue here is, is it new? Uh, this is what you're asking. And you know that that's what you're asking because if the person says yes, you should think that the shirt is new. And if the person says no, you should think it's not new. But this question also presupposes something, which is that it is a shirt, the object you're talking about. And you know that this is presupposed by the question because if the person answers yes, uh, you should think the thing is a shirt. But if the person answers no, you should also still think the thing is a shirt. So that's not what the question is asking, it's assumed. And then maybe there's some implicature here, which is that not all shirts are new because you specified that there's a new shirt. Probably some other shirts exist that aren't new. I'm not gonna talk so much about implicature today. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the distinction here between what's presupposed and what's at issue and uh, whether children are able to pick up on this distinction. And importantly, we're using this kind of structure all the time. Um, it's how we make sense of a discourse, uh, building up information over time. And it's not just a way of decomposing a single utterance. Uh, it reflects the flow of information from what's new and at issue into presupposed common ground. There's some uh, evidence that young kids are able to pick up on this flow of information in discourse. Uh, so for instance, work by Octar Carpenter and Tomasello shows that uh, two-year-olds know that speakers tend to talk about what is new. So if they're playing with some toys and uh, an experimenter wasn't there when a new toy was, um, or an experimenter left and a new toy was introduced, uh, the experimenter comes back and provides a label. Um, the child knows that they're likely talking about the object that was new to the experimenter, but not to the child themselves. 
And then also there's work by uh, Greenfield and Zukov showing that children at the one word stage tend to comment on new information in the environment. So uh, they looked at different transformations that can happen in the environment and decided what elements of them were changing and uh, what were static and then showed kids these uh, events and uh, these children tended to comment on the things that were at issue that were new uh, and changing in the environment. So this is some evidence that young kids pick up on this function of discourse on a, on a course level of talking about new information. But there's also evidence that uh, presupposition as a skill is much harder. Uh, so work by Hornby and by McWinney and Price uh, shows that children have a pretty tough time with syntactic presupposition uh, even through their adolescent years. So here children are presented with sentences and cards depicting different events. Uh, the cards are partial matches to the sentences and um, children don't differentiate between uh, whether the information in the picture that is incorrect was presupposed or at issue in the sentence uh, in choosing the cards, whereas adults do. So, you know, we have sort of conflicting information here about kids might be picking up on some of these high level uh, structures, but they also are having a tough time with sentence decomposition um, in an adult like fashion into these pieces of information that stand in different relations to the common ground, the uh, true, assumed true information in the discourse. And to take you back to this example, you know, if children are able to pick up on this kind of information, this kind of distinction, it would be a really useful skill because when you ask the question, is that a new shirt? And someone says, no, you're able to still know that that thing is a shirt. You can pick that sentence apart into two pieces of information and know that their no applies to one piece of information and not the other. And if you didn't know what a shirt was and you oversaw this encounter, you could also learn that this thing is a shirt, right? So I set out to test whether children were able to pick up on that uh, distinction. We designed a little pilot experiment in which children watched some exchanges between interlocutors about novel objects. So, hi, hi, is that a new blanket? No. Okay, so they uh, talk about this novel object, right? And someone asks a question and the other person responds. And then children were asked to make a choice between two uh, objects, one of which was in the video and referred to, and the other which is totally new. So they were asked to find the blicket, which was the label uh, given in the video. So in some conditions, the question was, is that a blicket? Um, and that's crossed with the different response types from the other interlocutor, yes or no. So what we're asking is whether kids are mapping uh, this object onto this label or this label onto this object. Um, and it should be pretty obvious here that if you hear, is that a blicket? Yes, you should be pretty certain that the thing is a blicket. And if you hear, is that a blicket? No, you should be less certain. And then we also had this other question with a modifier, new, is that a new blicket? Also crossed with uh, answer type. And so here the picture looks a little bit different uh, because what is at issue here is not the identity of the object, you should be relatively indifferent uh, to the answer to the question in determining whether you make this mapping. So you should think it's probably a blicket either way. So kids did eight of these trials, um, you know, video and then selection, video and then selection, and this is a two by two within subjects design. And so um, they got four uh, trials of each, uh, one of each condition type in a first block, and then we had a second block where again they got four of each condition. Um, and these were 34 participants. They're three to six year old kids, so preschoolers and uh, kindergartners, and they were tested on iPads at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. So what we're looking for here is an interaction between the question type and the answer type uh, in determining their proportion of the choice of the object they saw in the video. And in this pilot, uh, directionally, that's what we see. So we see that kids care more about this answer type in the case where the question was, is that a blicket, than when the question was, is that a new blicket? And then we thought, well, maybe we'll look at just the first four trials of this experiment. Uh, you know, Kids might be losing attention over the course of the task. It's a long task, eight trials for three-year-olds. Um, and also, they might find this task kind of pragmatically weird, so they might be attenuating their inferences over time. So looking at just the first four trials, this pattern becomes more exaggerated. So this was a little bit promising, but we wanted to uh, replicate this on a larger scale, a full-size experiment, to make sure that this pattern was real. Uh, and so this is 
pretty much the same uh, method. We just made the stimuli a little bit clearer, made the audio uh, less noisy. Uh, and uh, again, these were uh, three to six year olds and we have 74 participants this time. And so again, what we're looking for is this interaction and that's what we find, a significant interaction between the question type and the response type um, in kids' determination of the word referent mapping. So when the question is, is that obligate, they care a lot about the answer, yes or no, in determining whether they should make this uh, mapping. But when the question is, is that a new obligate, they are relatively more indifferent. And then when we look at the first four trials, again, it looks like this pattern is uh, more exaggerated. What I've shown you so far is that young children use this modifier as a cue that the name of the object is not what's at issue. Uh, so they're able to selectively learn the names of novel objects using this ability. And this seems to go beyond the uh, course abilities I talked about in the first part um, and looks a little bit more like decomposing a sentence into information that's at issue and information that's not. But you'll notice that this task isn't great at picking up on these differences. Um, so kids are choosing the target object, the one they saw in the video, at really high rates pretty much across the board, which isn't great. It's not what we think uh, as adults our intuition would be about how to do this task, right? So we thought maybe this test trial was like a little bit difficult for these young kids. Uh, just to remind you, this is what they had to do. Uh, find the blicket, and you have one object that you saw in a video, you saw referred to, uh, you saw referred to as a blicket, and then maybe it was negated or not. Um, and then you have another object about which you know absolutely nothing. And you're presented with this task of doing kind of complicated mutual exclusivity reasoning about two novel objects, right? Uh, one of which you have a lot more information about. So we thought maybe we could give kids a little bit more information to make this uh, test trial a bit easier on them. So I'm just gonna show you some preliminary data from uh, a new experiment that we're doing um, where we try to mitigate this issue with the test trial. Uh, this is a plan sample of 96 participants, but I just have 21 of them today. They're three to six year old kids, again, at the Museum of Science and Industry, and we pre-registered this experiment on the Open Science Framework. Um, we changed this test audio prompt. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. And this time we decided to just do four trials. It looks like over the course of the task, this uh, effect is sort of dropping off. So we thought, let's just do the part that we're confident in. And here's the new test trial. So kids here, look, a blicket and a dax. Can you find the blicket? Tap on the blicket. So here, they have a little bit more information that both of these objects likely have names and they're both candidates, reasonable candidates for being uh, the blicket. And what we find is that we did reduce kids' choice of that uh, target object by quite a bit. Uh, so it looks like this new test trial prompt is working. Um, they do reduce their choice of the, the target overall a little bit in all the trials. But you know, it's just 21 kids. There's a lot of variability here. Uh, but maybe promisingly, it looks like this interaction is directionally preserved. All right, so I've shown you, I've shown you uh, uh, a couple effects, right? Um, showing that kids might be using this modifier to infer that uh, the identity of an object is not an issue in a question. But there are several ways kids could be doing this, uh, so I just wanna flesh out some of the possibilities. A first way is that this is a syntactic cue they're picking up on, right? They hear a modifier and they reason that um, you know, the modifier is more likely to be at issue than the thing it describes. And in this case, any modifier should work pretty similarly. So uh, if the kid doesn't know the meaning of the modifier, uh, say it's a Glorpy Dax or something like that, um, they should maybe be able to do this. Um, and uh, similarly, it shouldn't, depend on the meaning of the modifier, even if they're familiar with that meaning. A second possibility is that this is a semantic cue. And in this case, uh, specificity is what matters. So children know, um, we think they know what new means, and they may know that a new thing is more specific than just a thing. Uh, and so they might reason that more specific information is more likely to be at issue. Uh, and in this case, it's a little bit hard to uh, tease apart these two explanations because they're confounded so often in everyday life. Uh, modifiers are often more specific than the things they describe. But in this case, um, redundant modifiers should work a little bit differently than modifiers that are contrastive or more informative. 
And a third possibility is that this is more of a pragmatic cue, and kids are integrating information about what the people in the scene know about the object. And in this case, uh, if you ask a question like, is that a blue blicket? And everyone in the scene can see that the thing is blue, you might reasonably assume that what's being asked about is the name of the object and not the color of the object, um, because it seems to be in the common ground already. So uh, in this case, visible modifiers, for instance, should work differently than ones that are not as easy to perceive. All right, so to wrap up, um, Today I've shown you a couple lines of evidence that show, or a couple experiments that uh, show, uh, suggest that young children can use presupposition to selectively learn the names of new objects. And this is potentially a viable tool for word learning. So these are three to six year old kids. Um, they're pretty young and they're in kind of prime years for doing word learning. They did uh, something that looks a little bit like word learning in our task. And so it's a, it's a potential skill at a time when they really need it. And to pull this all together, I think this is interesting because we usually think of discourse structure as a pretty high level and late learned skill um, that is learned on top of lower level skills like word learning. But discourse structure is a pervasive force that structures all the language that children hear. So if they're able to pick up on this kind of structure, even in small ways, that's potentially a very uh, strong, powerful tool for extracting more information from language uh, about words and the world they describe. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, uh, thanks for this talk. Um, I like this direction that you are you are taking this, but I am afraid that the interaction of modifier and presuppositionality might not be along the lines that you think it is. I think what's going on here, to the extent that, that you get this givenness effect, what's going on here is that the focus structure is manipulated in a particular way. So for example, if I say, is this a, you know, if I, if I ask, is this a new blicket? And you say no, then you infer that, that indeed, this is, this is a, a blicket. You might answer, no, it's an old blicket, right? On the other hand, if you ask, is this a new blicket? It's perfectly fine to respond with no, it's a new DAX, right? So depending on the focus structure of the, of the sentence, you might get a presuppositional inter inter um, interpretation or not, right? It didn't seem as though this was, uh, this was controlled for in your study, which might explain the fact that you don't get a strong effect, right? That you get an interaction, but it, it, it didn't, it's not striking in the way that, like, I mean, intuitively, it's, it's quite there if you, if you, if you ask, is this, an, is, this a, is this a new blicket, like, you know, like you, you get yeah. a very strong inference that it is indeed a blicket. Right, so uh, prior work has shown that contrastive stress does uh, kind of get this interpretation. So the McWinney work um, shows that we wanted to be very careful not to give kids clues by putting extra stress on the modifier. So, uh, Sorry. So um, our questions were stressed. We did our best to stress the questions equally on the modifier and uh, the name of the object. I agree that so stress would have probably exaggerated the effect. Um, uh, sorry, you're shaking your head. No, like it, so at least my understanding is that the focus is the effect, right? It's not a. It's not an exaggeration of an effect. It is the causal link between presuppositionality and the presence of this of this modifier. Okay, I, I could be misunderstanding, but so we try not to put uh, prosodic focus on the, the modifier here, and nevertheless, children seem to be doing something selective. Uh, so it looks to me like there's something going on with their thinking about the modifier alone. Um, but I do agree that manipulating stress on uh, the modifier or the name of the noun could change the interpretation of the sentence. Uh, so I should say that this is not like ironclad presupposition. Uh, a modifier like this is not a trigger in the same way others are. Yeah, which is why I think this is an interesting phenomenon because uh, it's not kind of uh, one class of words that uh, trigger presupposition and because we can play around with it uh, in the ways I sort of mapped out by changing the semantics and seeing if there are other factors uh, involved. So, yeah. Any other questions? 
Hi, uh, great talk. I, I was wondering um, if you had considered on the other direction the fact that you put them in a situation where they have to accommodate the presupposition. And we know from work on uh, the discourse particle two that uh, both with adults and with children, that when you ask them to do that, they find it, adults find it difficult, and in fact, children find it difficult, but even three-year-olds will actually take into account the presupposition linked to two in context, for instance, where they don't have to accommodate. And there are a few other elements like that. So I was thinking whether you thought of, because I've, I found the fact that at, you know, three to six-year-old weren't do understanding this presupposition more actually quite surprising when you compare it to the findings that are there on two, for instance. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'd love to manipulate whether they are sort of pushed to accommodate uh, this presupposition. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do this across a bigger age range. I didn't get to present the sort of age range data today, but there's some weird stuff going on that I think is potentially connected to uh, Hannes Rakoshi's point uh, the other day, uh, that you know the older kids here might be picking up on the fact that uh, this is a little bit strange, um, or knowing that they should maybe be accommodating something. So um, yeah, I'd be really interested to look into that. Thank you. OK, let's thank our speaker. And the final talk in the session will be from Mirto Grigoroglu from the University of Toronto. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I've heard a lot about this conference, so I'm very excited. Um, it stood up to the expectations, and I want to thank the organizers uh, for um, making everything so good. Uh, so this is uh, a new line of work that I have started with uh, Patricia Ghana at the University of Toronto. Uh, so uh, conversation is theoretically defined as a form of rational behavior which requires the speaker and the hearer to work collaboratively towards the achievement of a mutual goal. To take an example, if a collaborative speaker wants to request a glass of water, given a display like this, she needs to specify uh, which one she means so that the listener can uh, disambiguate between the two potential reference. So for instance, in this case, she should say something like, give me the tall glass. Because if she fails to do so, then the listener won't be able to identify the appropriate referent, and this would be the case of an uncooperative conversational exchange. Given that speaker and hearer need to work collaboratively to get the message across, several theoretical accounts consider conversation as uh, just one form of cooperative rational behavior, no different to other non-linguistic forms of communication like gestures or even other non-communicative prosocial behaviors such as sharing or helping. The assumption is that all these forms of social action rely on the same in infrastructure of uh, shared intentionality, the ability of humans to read the mind of others, and the shared motivation to help each other achieve mutually beneficial, beneficial goals. On this analysis, there are apparent similarities between uh, the structuring of conversation and other um, non-communicative social actions. So for instance, an important aspect of conversation uh, is to request others for information, which can be considered equivalent to asking for help. Another important function of conversation is to offer information to others, which can be considered equivalent to helping uh, or sharing resources with others. Although these links have been drawn theoretically, uh, we don't know how far we can push them empirically. We also don't know whether the collaboration expectations guiding behavior in the uh, broad social domain follow, uh, and conversation follow a similar developmental trajectory. So research on the broad social domain has shown that children have specific expectations about how parties that have entered into a collaborative interaction should behave. Uh, specifically, children beginning at around age three and a half, as uh, Mike Tomasello presented earlier today, um, make a distinction between cooperative and uncooperative partners 
and uh, they are more likely to share resources with partners who have previously shared resources with them than with defectors who had never shared resources. So in the current study, we want to know whether children would make a similar distinction in the conversation domain, and uh, we would like to know whether children would be more, uh, less likely to share information with partners who previously did not share information with them. So our overarching goal here is to investigate whether and to what extent children have the same reciprocity expectations in conversation and the broader social action. So in the, to answer this question, in the current study, we ask whether children's linguistic behavior is affected by whether a partner previously violated conversational expectations, specifically the expectation that a speaker needs to be appropriately informative. To investigate this question, we first ask whether preschool aged children can uh, explicitly distinguish between informative and underinformative communicative partners. And then we went on to ask whether they adjust the amount of information that they give based on uh, how informative their partner was towards them in the previous interaction. Our hypothesis, methods, and analysis have been pre registered at the Open Science Framework. So our participants in this study were four and five-year-old children who were recruited and tested both at a lab setting and at a museum setting, so at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto and in our lab. And uh, we chose preschool-aged children for the obvious reasons that there is a lot of uh, development happening, both in the communicative domain and also in the social domain uh, within these ages. Uh, for our procedure, we asked children to perform two tasks in two different tables, so we separated the two tasks in this uh, simple way. So uh, first, children were asked to perform an informativeness rating task, which would allow us to assess whether children can detect um, the speaker's by uh, conversational violations. So in this task, we asked children to rate the informativeness of two speakers. And uh, then we asked them to move over to a different table where uh, they played a different game, um, a referential communication uh, game in which, uh, which allowed us to assess how informative children were as speakers. And in this task, children were asked to uniquely identify a target object so that uh, their listener could successfully identify it as in a standard referential communication task. Looking more closely into the specifics of each of these tasks, uh, in the informativeness rating task, children were presented with two speakers, two puppets enacted by a second experimenter who uh, would help children find hidden stickers. Um, then, children were asked to evaluate how helpful and informative each of these speakers were in a simple two-point evaluation scale. So uh, we told children that if the puppets did a good job, uh, they should get a big strawberry, but if they didn't, they should get a small strawberry. Uh, trials in the informativeness rating task would look something like this. So the children would be presented with three containers then uh, the experimenter would hide a sticker inside one of these containers uh, behind a visual barrier so that the child could not see what was going on, uh, but the puppet would be behind the barrier and she could watch, and then uh, the puppet would give a verbal clue to the children about how to locate the sticker. We had two within subjects conditions in this uh, task, so the one puppet, the one speaker, was always informative and helpful and would uh, produce a clue that would allow children to successfully identify the location of the sticker. So in this case, the puppet would say the sticker is in the toll cup, while uh, the other puppet was always underinformative and unhelpful, and she would provide an ambiguous clue that wouldn't allow children to find the sticker. So she would say the sticker is in the blue cup, but there is two blue cups here. To uh, ensure that, uh, to convey that this was, uh, that the informativeness of each speaker was uh, a stable trait of the speakers and not incidental, we had two trials per speaker and uh, to ensure that even our youngest children would be able to successfully judge 
that the under-informative speaker was less helpful, we had the informative speaker always appear first. For uh, our referential communication task, we told children that now it was their turn to help their partner. The partner had uh, a board game, and her goal was to identify the right cards that would allow her to complete the game and win a treasure. And uh, the partner was given a binder with all the cards that she would need to play this game. But importantly, the partner did not know which card was the right one every time, so she needed the child's help. So children were presented with um, an array of four cards in a computer screen, which were identical to the cards that the puppet had. But importantly, chil uh, children were told which one was the target object, indicated here by a red arrow. And uh, the child's task was to describe the target card so that uh, the puppet could identify it. And uh, for test trials, uh, the target card was contrastive to some other card in the array. Therefore, uh, to identify the target, children would need to produce an appropriate modifier. So here they should say it's the blue backpack. And uh, what we measured was whether children measured, um, mentioned the uh, modifier or not. So for this task, we had two between subjects conditions. So half of the children played the second game, the referential communication game, with a helpful partner, and the other half of the children played the game with the unhelpful partner. For our predictions, um, for the informativeness rating task, we predicted that if children are pragmatically sensitive, they should give the big reward to the informative puppet and the small reward to the underinformative puppet. Uh, then for our referential communication task, if children's expectations of collaboration are similar in the communication and the broader social domain, uh, we expected that children would be more likely to produce target modifiers for the helpful partner and less likely to produce target modifiers for the unhelpful partner. So we expected to see a difference between these two conditions. Uh, we also pre-registered some exploratory analysis. So we expected that um, children's, uh, children's tendency to produce modifiers for the sake of a helpful partner might be affected by their own judgments of how helpful their partner was in the, um, um, in the informativeness rating task. So we expected there to see some um, effects. So uh, here are the results for our informativeness rating task. Uh, what this table illustrates is the number of children who gave a big or a small reward to each of the speakers. And uh, the columns in bold uh, indicate the appropriate reward uh, for each speaker. So as you can see, uh, children were very successful at giving the big reward to the informative speaker. And they were also successful at giving the small reward to the underinformative speaker, although there was more variation in children's responses for the underinformative speaker, which was confirmed by a mixed effects logistic regression analysis that uh, yielded a significant effect of speaker um, here. Okay, moving on to our uh, results from the referential communication task. Um, I uh, want to remind you that what we measured here was whether children mentioned the target modifier or not. And what you can see in this uh, graph, uh, the blue bars are uh, the mentions in the helpful partner condition, and the orange bars are the mentions in the unhelpful partner condition. Uh, as you can see, children's mention, uh, mentions of modifiers are uh, low, although five-year-olds uh, mentioned more modifiers than four-year-olds. However, importantly, there was no difference in um, whether in the mentions of modifiers across conditions with children uh, using the same amount of modifiers for both helpful and unhelpful partners. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also uh, wanted to perform an exploratory analysis to see how children's own pragmatic judgments may affect these results. So we categorized children in pragmatic and non-pragmatic responders and we coded as pragmatic responders children who gave the informative puppet a big reward and the underinformative puppet a small reward. And uh, these were the pragmatic responders and the rest of the children were the non-pragmatic responders. 
so by adding uh, this um, coding, which we call pragmatic sensitivity in our model, uh, we found that uh, there was a significant interaction of age, partner, and pragmatic sensitivity. And to better understand this interaction, I'm uh, graphing results from pragmatic and non-pragmatic responders separately. So uh, for kids who were pragmatic responders, which was the majority of the children in our sample, if you remember from the informativeness ratings, um, there was no difference in how frequently they mentioned modifiers for helpful and unhelpful partners. But there was a difference in the case of the non-pragmatic responders, specifically the non-pragmatic five-year-olds were the ones who offered more um, modifiers for a helpful partner. Uh, however, because um, these children were a minority in our sample and uh, the numbers of children in each of these cells are small, it is, uh, we want to be cautious about how, to, how we interpret this. So to summarize, we saw that although four and five-year-olds were overall sensitive to speakers' violations of informativeness, they did not tailor their descriptions to the informativeness of their partner, with the exception, perhaps, of the non-pragmatic responders. So how can we explain these results? Uh, the first possibility, the first obvious possibility, is that perhaps the broad uh, cooperation expectations may operate differently in the communicative and non-communicative domains. So perhaps children in, the, in, conver uh, in conversation are more tolerant to violations of cooperation than in other social interactions in the sense that perhaps an under-informative uh, communicator is less bad than a defector who doesn't share resources in uh, pro-social action. Uh, the other possibility, of course, is that um, the um, expectations may be similar in the two domains, but perhaps our task did not uh, capture this difference because of task-specific factors. So um, there is a possibility that the developmental trajectory of the expectations in the two domains might be different. So uh, although in uh, social action we uh, see it arising at around three and a half, Perhaps in language, it may arise later. We know that uh, pragmatics develops well beyond the preschool years. So it is possible that school-aged children uh, might be more likely to show um, different behavior towards cooperative and uncooperative uh, partners. Uh, another um, possibility is that the broad context of the uh, context of the interaction may have affected children's motivation to be informative so um, if you remember um, I told you that we tested children both in a lab setting and the museum setting which um, in retrospect may have uh, affected our results because these two settings have very different pragmatics Children who come in the lab have repeated interactions with us, have been to the lab before, and uh, they're very likely to come to the lab again. So they may be more motivated to help the uh, scientists. Uh, well, in the museum, it's more of a one-shot interaction where um, they're less likely to uh, see any of us again. So moving forward, uh, we would like to eliminate the task-specific limitations. Uh, we would like to expand uh, the age range of um, our sample to school-aged children and also control systematically for the experimental context. Uh, we would also like to do direct comparisons of conversation and pro-social action. So we want to know how, uh, whether children's tendency to, more, to offer more information to cooperative partners, to the extent that we find this, corresponds to patterns of sharing um, non-linguistically. And uh, also it is important to uncover the underlying mechanism. So to the extent that we do find a difference between how children behave to uh, cooperative versus uncooperative conversational partners, whether um, children are penalizing unhelpful partners by offering less information as um, is uh, suggested by the literature on uh, prosociality or whether uh, children are simply more motivated to offer information to a partner who has been helpful towards them, as is suggested by uh, literature in pragmatics. So here I would like to stop. 
Uh, I would like to thank everyone who made this research possible and you for attending this talk. We have some time for questions. We have one here in the back on the left side. Thank you very much for your talk. So I was wondering about the timing of the, of the rewards. So were the kids allowed to search for the sticker before they were choosing between the big strawberry or the small strawberry? Yes. Okay, because then there's a potential confound with success and a representation of informativity. I believe I mentioned there's a paper by Gillis and Nielsen in 2013 uh, using this type of paradigm, and they use it with preschoolers and primary school kids, and the four to five year olds and the f um, six to seven, both groups, were successful. So um, the same type of behavior you show, they, they seek help from the guy who got them to the success. But when they were asked to seek for help, in your case it would be reward them, before they could search for the sticker, only the primary school kids noticed who had provided enough information and who hadn't, right? Mm -hmm. Who had been ambiguous. So I think that if, in, uh, if you want that this is about informativity and not just success, uh, you would need to you know, play with the timing of, of when you ask them to, to you know, give the reward. Right, that's a, that's a very good point. So here, this is the first experiment of what we hope to be a series of experiments. So we wanted to really um, knock children on the head on how helpful and informative the one uh, speaker is and um, how under-informative the other one is, uh, but uh, you know, certainly you can do a lot of manipulations about this and there are certainly uh, important steps to take forward. Another question? I think we'll take uh, right here in the front. Uh, I wanna ask about the other task, the reciprocity task. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, it, it, there's a difference of potentially of intention as well as a sort of cooperation uh, competition. So. Um, if somebody's not informative about, and they say get the blue cup, I just think they're sort of dumb. I don't think they're 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 uncooperative. I just right. think they didn't do a good job of it. I'm assuming cooperation in that context, and the reason I'm assuming cooperation is because they have no reason to uh, uh, to uh, try to get over on me. Right. Uh, whereas in sharing resources, I'm always suspicious that they're going to try to keep more for themselves. So. It, it, the, the sort of general cooperative structure is not the same, and the intentionality is probably not the same. So uh, I wouldn't really expect the reciprocity in the situation you had. Uh, you're you, you're uh, right about that, and actually, this might be you know a difference um, between the two domains in that way because you cannot. There is definitely similarities, but also there are differences, and. Uh, you mentioned it exactly that when someone doesn't offer as much information as we expect, we don't assume that this person is withholding information with a purpose. You need to build this into the task to um, have children believe that you know maybe uh, the, the puppet could win the sticker for herself if the child didn't find it. But um, yeah, we wanted to do it simply as that to see whether if someone is under informative and therefore unhelpful because the children don't get the stickers, whether this would change their subsequent behavior towards them, which we don't really see here. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, so let's thank our speaker.